Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, this is the second video on the Johnson Viking Adventurer transmitter that I'm repairing and it's all about the mighty 807 vacuum tube. Can I find a way to test the stash that I have? Let's find out. In the first episode of this series, I showed my collection of 14 807s, all of which are of uncertain condition. I also mentioned that the 807 is not compatible with my Sencor tube tester, but that I had an idea for an alternative way to test them. And that idea comes from General Electric, one of the largest former manufacturers of the 807. A quick web search turned up this May-June 1951 edition of Ham News that contains three basic performance tests that one can perform on transmitter tubes of that era, including the 807. But before I get into the details, I want to spend a few moments talking about the Ham News publication itself. From what I was able to find on WorldRadioHistory.com, Ham News was a six times a year technical publication that ran from 1938 through early 1963. The issues gave engineering information about how to apply GE vacuum tubes and in some cases included very detailed multi-part series for building receivers, transmitters, and test equipment. Nowadays, of course, we call such publications white papers. They're a mix of practical technical info and thinly disguised advertising, all intended to promote a company's products to the engineering community. And apparently RCA had their version too, called Ham Tips. I'm going to try to read all of these someday. These look really interesting. Anyway, back to that May-June 1951 issue. It describes three tests, the first of which is just a simple check with an ohmmeter to verify the filament resistance is correct and to verify no shorts exist where they shouldn't. Now, the short circuit test is obviously done at low voltage, so it may not catch shorts that could occur at operating voltages. But it is an easy enough test to do, and if any tubes fail here, then I'm saving the time and effort to do the subsequent tests. And fortunately, all 14 tubes pass the simple test. The second test is called the static characteristic test, and it quantifies how much control grid voltage is needed to obtain a specific magnitude of plate current. For the 807, it specifies applying 500 volts to the plate, 250 volts to the screen grid, and then setting the control grid voltage to obtain 50 milliamps of plate current. Per the table, that should require between minus 15 and minus 25 volts. Anything outside those limits implies a suspect tube. And because I'm enjoying going down this rabbit hole, I was able to confirm that GE's test parameters do indeed make sense by cross-referencing them to their competitor's 807 datasheet, RCA in this case. Here on curve number 307-210, we see plate current versus plate voltage for several different values of control grid voltage. And this graph just so happens to be for a screen voltage of 250 volts. So looking at where a plate voltage of 500 volts and a plate current of 50 milliamps intersects, that occurs at a control grid voltage of minus 20 volts. Amazing, that smack in the middle of the minus 15 to minus 25 volt range given in GE's test procedure. How about that? They made tubes that were interchangeable with each other. Now, before I jump in and set up this test, I've got one small problem. I don't have a way to generate 500 volts DC. However, I can generate 250 volts by using my Heathbuilt EUW15 power supply. I restored it about a year ago, and there's a whole series of videos on that project that I'll link to above. The EUW15 can provide 200 to 350 volts regulated DC at up to 100 milliamps, so that'll work. It can also power the filament in the 807. So going back to the plot, notice how the curves in this region are essentially flat. I'm guessing that's analogous behavior to FETs and BJTs, where increasing VCE or VDS doesn't result in much change in conducted current. At any rate, setting the screen to 250 volts and dropping the plate from 500 volts to 250 volts to match the screen grid voltage still results in about 50 milliamps of plate current with minus 20 volts at the control grid. So I'll proceed to use those as my test parameters and see what results I get from this 807 collection. The third and final test in this article is called the Limited Peak Emissions Test. And it's quite a bit simpler. Just connect the plate and the two grids together, put 45 volts across them in the cathode, and measure the plate current. 
For a new tube, the current should be at least 255 milliamps, and for a used tube, 190 milliamps minimum. Now apparently there's one tiny caveat. Do not do this test for more than four seconds. Ideally get your data in just one second or else you'll risk damaging the tube. I see what they're doing here. It's essentially converting the tube into a giant diode, which is basically what my Sencor tester does when it checks emission, but certainly not at this level of stress. I'll need a fixture to properly hold the 807s, and luckily in my junk box I already had an appropriate socket. All I needed to do was mount it to a scrap piece of 2x4, add a pot to let me vary the grid voltage, wire it up to a header, and I was good to go. Now let's test some tubes. Alright, I've got my 2x4 fixture all connected up to everything I need here. Let me walk through it really quickly. Of course the EUW15 is providing the heater voltage and the high voltage. So this is the heater voltage right here, and I do have a half ohm resistor in series with it. Now what I found when I was um, troubleshooting this is of course having higher line voltages nowadays I was getting a slightly higher filament voltage there. It was almost 7 volts when um, the tube was warming up so I decided it's a little too much so I put a half ohm resistor in series with that and that dropped it down to about 6.3 to 6.4 volts so much better for running this test. As far as the rest of the setup goes the Heath 2718 power supply there in the background that's providing the negative bias for the grid. I've got all three outputs daisy chained together, which you can do on that power supply because all three of them are floating and I'm able to get to minus 30 volts at the far low end when I have this potentiometer turned all the way down. So that's keeping the grid voltage very low and keeping the tube almost shut off when I start the test. The rest of the meters, this multimeter here is measuring the plate current and then this smaller multimeter next to it is just keeping an eye on that high voltage. It should read 250 volts throughout the test when I turn on the high voltage and not, not droop. And then lastly, the Keithley in the background, that's monitoring the actual grid voltage. When I start turning that potentiometer, it'll tell me just how much voltage is at the grid. So what I want to do since these tubes have been sitting around for a while is I'm going to turn on just the heater, so just the 6.3 volts. Now on this power supply there's a separate switch for the high voltage that's off so right now all I'm doing is, in, is powering the heater in the tube and I'll let this warm up for about 10 minutes and come back and run the test. Alright it's been 10 minutes it's time to run the test and before I start flipping switches notice the Keithley is showing there's just under negative 1 volts on the grid which is an interesting observation I guess with the heater turned on in the tube and no other voltages impressed on the grids of the plate, you do get a little bit of negative bias there on that uh, control grid for some reason. But anyway, it's going to change here in a big hurry when I turn on the Heath power supply in the background, put that minus 30 volts on it, then I'm going to turn on the high voltage, and then I'm going to start adjusting this pot right here until I get that meter right there to read 50 milliamps, and then I'm going to shut off the high voltage. So if you've got all that, follow along as I test this tube. This item contains hazardous voltage and safety precautions must be followed. If you're following along and working on your own version, you're doing so at your own risk. Of course my pot's a little squeaky. Start bringing up that current, almost 30 milliamps. And oh, I overshot it a bit there, 50 milliamps. Shut off the high voltage and record minus 15 volts on the grid. So that's right at the limit that I would interpret from the material that was in the GE test procedure. And I'll include on screen now the test results that I got on all the other tubes. And as you can see, they all basically fell between minus 15 and minus 20 volts on the grid. So I'm going to interpret that to mean that they've all passed this simple test. Now, I say simple because there's obviously lots of other ways a tube could malfunction in an RF transmitter and I won't know for sure if it's going to work right until I get it in the rig and test it out. Now of course I still have the third test, that emissions test, which I'm going to do next, but I got to break down this entire setup and reconnect it for that test. So I'll go through the details next and then see how these tubes perform.
Okay, I've changed the setup to run test three, the limited peak emissions test. And the setup is a little simpler. There's only two meters here. The multimeter in the middle, as before, is measuring current. And the Keithley now is measuring just to verify that I've got at least 40 to 45 volts that I'm applying to the interconnected plates and, or interconnected grids, I should say, in the plate. And the way I'm running the test setup, like before, I have just the heater on, let the tube warm up for about 10 minutes. And because this is such a short duration test, just a few seconds, I've got the heat power supply in the background, of course, shut off. Uh, to run the test, I'm going to turn it on for just a couple of seconds and look at the reading on the meter in the middle and jot down how many milliamps I record. So here we go. I'm going to test tube number 14 right now. All right, that's all there was to it, about 336 milliamps. And I'll put on screen now the results for all 14 tubes. And as it turns out, 10 of them had current of at least 255 milliamps. So they're exceeding the threshold that GE established for a new tube. Two of them are in between a used tube, meaning uh, 190 milliamps and 255 milliamps for a new tube. But two of them were below 190, and actually quite a bit below. So I'm going to consider those tubes duds and unlikely to work correctly in this adventure. But the positive side is after all of these series of tests, it looks like I have at least better confidence now that I should have 10 tubes here to pick from to get this adventurer back on the air. So that's it. Kind of a short episode today, but hopefully I got to the point quickly enough to show how I decided to test those 807s. Now looking ahead, I have already started the disassembly and cleaning of the rig, and I'm hoping that I'll have a short parts list by the time I'm done of new things and replacement things that I need to buy to put this back together in working order. I thank you for watching this series, and I do hope you're enjoying it. And until next time, bye for now.